Now let's move to our topic. I think this was the most difficult topic, uh, trying to come up with a name for this. I called it Feasts and More. Uh, every chapter has its own kind of content. It's really a potpourri of several different things going on here in these last, what, five chapters or whatever it is of Leviticus. I want to concentrate on the feasts. I want to spend most of my time talking about the feasts. Uh, in other words, the calendar, the, the annual calendar of high holy events for the Jewish people. Um, which it happens in chapter 23, which is the first chapter that, that we, in our set of chapters for tonight. I want to spend most of the time talking about that. And so for that reason, I'm going to leave that till last. So I'm going to skip chapter 23, go straight to chapter 24, and briefly touch on a few things throughout these last four, five, six, seven, uh, last four chapters. Okay, chapter 24 gives more instructions for priests. We've already had several chapters that gave instructions for priests. This chapter has more of them. In particular, how to prepare the oil for the tabernacle lamps, how to prepare the bread for the tabernacle uh, setting. Uh, and so instructions about that. And then the chapter ends with an anecdote about a fellow who commits blasphemy and what happens in that in the aftermath of that. They kind of bring him before the Lord. What do you want us to do with this guy? Uh, he's stoned. And uh, the point of this is to sort of serve as an example. Here's something that happened. Here's how we dealt with it. Here's how the Lord wanted us to deal with it. And then now that becomes model for going forward. This is what we will do with this kind of person. Um, this is also the portion of Scripture where we get the notion of, not the notion, the, um, the piece, the, the prescription for eye for an eye and two for the two for a tooth uh, comes from this chapter. Um, more so than being a, I mean, I'm not aware of anything where they, somebody actually did an eye for an eye, you know. It's a principle. It's a principle of justice. Justice, if, 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 if such and such is done, justice demands equality of outcome of that, that same on the other side of the scale of justice, right? A balancing of the scale. It's a principle of justice. Okay. Chapter 25 uh, talks about uh, the Sabbath a little bit, which we've already discussed some. And then it talks about the Jubilee and uh, I thought I would break this up a little bit by having somebody else share with us on this particular topic. This fella, I've come across this guy recently. His name is David Pawson, P-A-W-S-O-N. And uh, I, I, like I said, just recently I've come across him, and he is quite the Bible teacher. Anybody ever heard of David Pawson? One, okay. I am just really enjoying YouTubing my little heart out on David Pawson. And uh, so he, 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 I haven't totally agreed with every single interpretive thing that I've heard from him, but m way vast majority, way vast majority. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really happy with this dude. Uh, he's, uh, well, if he's, he was born in 1930, so I guess, I, I don't know if he's, I, I, don't, I don't think so. He would be 93, I guess. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll let him explain to you the Jubilee from uh, chapter 25. Uh, if you would, Cole, start us off at 2806. These were annual, this was weekly, and this was every 50 years. And what a jubilee it was. Every 50 years, everybody's bank balance was leveled up. Wouldn't you like that here? 
you look a little uncertain, some of you. I can tell from your faces whether you've got a big bone balance or a little one. But you see, all the property was reverted to the family that originally owned it every 50th year so that the leases got cheaper as you got nearer the 50th year because they were shorter. And slaves were set free on the 50th year. All sorts of lovely things happened. So people looked forward to the Jubilee, to the acceptable year of the Lord, when there was good news for the poor because they'd be rich again, when the captives would be set at liberty. Now, does that strike a chord with you? Jesus proclaimed the Spirit of the Lord is on me to set at liberty the captive and good news for the poor to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, Jesus began the real jubilee to which every one of these had been looking forward. See how important it is to know the Old Testament, to understand the new. Now we come to this very important but difficult question. How about that? Cool? Very good. Chapter 26. Uh, this is where we get a, um, a, a kind of set of uh, God is speaking to the people again and, and saying, do what I say and here's what will happen. If you do well, you'll have good things. If you don't do well, you won't have good things. It parallels very strongly Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you're familiar with that chapter. Uh, where uh, even more so there's uh, just strong warnings, strong blessings for doing well uh, in obedience and strong um, warnings for not doing well. So if you do what I say, I will bless you, the Lord says. If you don't do what I say, I will curse you. If you repent, I will receive you. That is the message of chapter 26 of Leviticus. The last chapter of the book Chapter 27, again, we're going to go back and hit chapter 23 here in a minute, but the last chapter, the theme of it is redemption. We have all kinds of ways to redeem things. So think about a book that is the law. It's more law than any other book in the law. You know, we call the law, the first five books, we call it the law, but this is the centerpiece of the law, Leviticus. And the last chapter is on redemption. I think that's fitting. I think it's fitting for us to see that this law which brings death, we learn in the New Testament, ends with the theme of redemption. Now, the theme of redemption is not, he's, the, the Leviticus 27 is not talking about Jesus. It's not talking about us being redeemed by Jesus or anything like that, but ways to redeem certain things. For example... All kinds of things and even people, beings that can be redeemed. People can be redeemed. Animals can be redeemed. Land and houses can be redeemed, for example. Here's an example of how, uh, how a redemption might take place. Let's say that you have a, a mother or a family that is desperate for the Lord's help and might make a vow to the Lord such as, I will give my children to the service of the Lord's tabernacle. So I I'm, I'm need you, Lord, and here's what I'm willing to give because I'm desperate. I'm willing to give everything. I'm willing to give my children to your service. And then graciously the Lord allows those children to be redeemed. In other words, I have vowed my children... I can't take back that vow because the overarching theme here is whatever vows are made unto the Lord have to be kept. Have to be kept, have to be honored. And so the Lord allows you to keep that vow, but in a different way by redeeming that child in this scenario. Okay, So you're going to pay an amount of money to the tabernacle, to the priest, to the service of the Lord to redeem, to buy back uh, in, in this scenario that we're making up, this child. And the value is set. This is how much it would cost to redeem these people. This is how much it would cost to redeem certain animals. So the same thing. You could vow an animal uh, to the Lord and then you can redeem it. 
Also, uh, I mentioned land and houses is also mentioned here. And at the end of the chapter, we get the first uh, laws regarding the tithe. And so here's what to do with the tithe. Tithe, of course, meaning 10%. And there were all these ways of bringing the tithe, bringing the uh, produce of the land um, to the Lord, to, for it to be His. Um, and these, tithe, these tithes could also be redeemed. So, for example, let's say I had a, uh, my crops, my harvest was weak one year, and I, I didn't have a, a very good harvest, let's say. I, or I did, whatever. But if I, if I did, let's say I didn't. Now I want to redeem my own tithe. In other words, I want to buy back from the Lord what is His in terms of my crops, in terms of my harvest, whether it's for food so that I can have something to eat or for replanting. Okay? Instead of me giving it to the Lord, which is His, I buy it back. And if I buy it back, it's going to cost me 120% of its value to redeem the tithe. But there are all these elements uh, that can be redeemed. And so, again, the last chapter of this book of the law deals with redemption. And I think that's fitting. All right. The last chapter, which is not the last chapter, the first chapter of our last five chapters is chapter 23, where we talk about the feasts. And this is really where I want to spend most of our time. The feasts, uh, in other words, the calendar of events, high holy days for the, the Israelites, uh, may be broken up into two groups. The first part of the year uh, and the second part of the year. The first part of the year, uh, the, the beginning of the year begins in what we would call March. So the new year begins in March. And so the first feast, which is the Feast of Passover with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, Passover begins on the 14th day of the first month, and Unleavened Bread begins on the 15th day of the first month. And so that is going to fall in that March-April area. That's the beginning of the beginning of their year is in March, and that, that first Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread is going to fall in that March-April area. Um, Passover and unleavened bread we've already seen, of course, in Exodus, right? We, we, we went through the Passover. We went through the instructions for the Passover, and you're supposed to keep this feast. You know, so we've, we've been over this ground. Uh, but Passover, again, uh, re reflecting, remembering when uh, the death angel passed over, the blood was on the doorpost and so forth, and uh, God saved his people from the death angel um, and so that's Passover, remembering that. And then unleavened bread, they're remembering their journey out of Egypt and how they made that journey with haste. And so you remember that they did not have any yeast in the bread um, so that they could uh, go quickly and, and not have to worry about the time it takes for the yeast to rise and all of that. So it's remembering the things that God has done for them. So Passover and uh, unleavened bread go right there at the beginning of the year. Uh, in the middle of that week of unleavened bread, we have the feast of first fruits. And this is explained in chapter 23 of Leviticus. And it, it says, on the day after the Sabbath. In other words, in, after that Passover and in that week of unleavened bread, on the day after the Sabbath, which would be Sunday... Uh, we have the Feast of First Fruits. Uh, here is what it says in chapter 23, beginning in verse 10. When you come into the land which I give you to reap its harvest and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits to, of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. Now, how do we know what Sabbath it is? Look at the next uh, verse 15 where it begins to talk about the third feast, which is the Feast of Weeks. You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf and the wave offering, so the one that we just had, will be seven Sabbaths completed. 
Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, a week. In the middle of that week, on the Sunday, on the day after the Sabbath, we get the first fruits offering. The priest waves the first sheaf. Seven weeks later, on the day after Sabbath, they uh, do another holy day, and they, uh, you will offer a new grain offering unto the Lord. Okay, well, how can it be a new grain offering over here and a new grain offering over here? The, f- the, the uh, Feast of Weeks is uh, wheat. So, v- most likely, the uh, first fruits is barley. Barley harvest comes in about a month before wheat. And so the first fruits offering where he raises that sheaf and waves it is barley, uh, which comes in April, and the wheat comes in in May. Okay? Now, a little bit about this. Feast of weeks. The word, English word weeks, Shavuot. If, if you look at the, the, the way it's spelled, it's actually pronounced some other way. Some way, you know how pronunciations are. But S-H-A-V-U-O-T is how it's spelled. Um, Feast of Weeks, also called what? Pentecost. Pentecost for the 50 days. Weeks for the weeks. So seven weeks or 50 days. Well, seven weeks is 49 days, right? So how are we getting this? Probably by a system of, of counting uh, that involves inclusive reckoning. In other words, starting the counting with the first day, and then you end on day 50. We actually do count this way even today in some, some respects. I'll give you an example. Musical intervals are counted this way. Inclusive counting. If I want to measure a third... I count one, two, three. So it's actually only two steps from one to three, but we call it a third. And if I put another third on top of that, it's one, two, three. So two thirds makes a one, two, three, four, five. Two thirds makes a fifth in music because I'm starting with one instead of starting with zero, starting with Zero, one, but I'm starting with one. So in music, three plus three equals five. Okay? That's the same principle of the inclusive counting where I start counting on Sunday as one. Then when I get to the next Sunday, when I get to Sunday seven weeks from now, I'm on 50 instead of 49. Okay? All right. So that's a little bit about that. Traditionally, the Feast of Weeks Again, initially it was the wheat, the wheat harvest, but tr- the Jewish tradition holds that the Feast of Weeks celebrated or commemorated or landed on the day when the law was given at Mount Sinai. That's going to be important in a minute. Okay. The first three feasts that go together as a group, Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, and then Feast of Weeks. So far, so good. Three that go together as a group. And I'll explain what that group is about in a minute. The second group happens in the middle of the year, or in other words, at the end of the harvest season. Let me read another verse to you. Um, Yeah, right here. Exodus 34, Exodus, not Leviticus, Exodus 34, 22. And you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest, there's that wheat part, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So we have these two parts of the feast, the, the year beginning and the year ending. The year beginning, the harvest beginning, and the harvest ending, the last ingathering. So this third, second set of three is in that back half of the year, really the beginning of the second half of the year, but the end of the harvest season, beginning with the Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets occurs on the first day of the seventh month. 
The seventh month would be the middle of the year, right? So six months. And then the first day of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. Okay. And it's right just before we get the last harvest. Okay. The Feast of Trumpets. It doesn't say much about the Feast of Trumpets. It just says blow some trumpets. It doesn't say, it did give a whole lot there, but we're supposed to celebrate there in that uh, beginning of the celebration of the end of the harvest season. Uh, but there's supposed to be trumpets there for the day, uh, first day of the seventh month. Now, this is when in our world, about September, October range. September, October range is for these last three uh, feasts. So, Feast of Trumpets, beginning of this. Uh, uh, set of three, the second set of three, D day 10, 10th day of the seventh month, we get the Day of Atonement. We know what that's about. We already went through that a couple weeks ago. Day of Atonement occurs after the Feast of Trumpets and before the Feast of Tabernacles or booths or tents, okay, um, which is the, the last of the, uh, this group of three here, okay? I don't need to go into a Day of Atonement because we already did that, but that's where it falls. The 15th day of the seventh month. So all of these occur now within a 15-day range. Okay, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and then uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, Tabernacles means what? Tents. Okay. Verse 42, Leviticus 23. You shall dwell in booths. That's another way to say tabernacles or tents. You shall dwell in tents. For seven days, all who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, so that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. We are commemorating uh, God bringing them out of Egypt and this time when they lived in tents, which is now, by the way, Leviticus, right? Right? Uh, later on, they go into the promised land, they begin building houses. But right now, they're in tents. So when they start this practice, they're actually in the tents. So they're commemorating what they're already doing, okay? Being in the tents when they were brought out of Egypt, okay? Um, that is Feast of Tabernacles. All right. Three over here, beginning of the year. Three over here, end of the year. First three deal with the beginning of harvest. Last three deal with the end of harvest, okay? All right, that's a little bit about the calendar. Now, we're going to go directly into the second look segment. We'll have the exercise afterward because you want this piece of information before you do the exercise. We want to look at the fulfillment of the feast in the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ, okay? How do these six, uh, how are these six feasts, six and a half feasts, fulfilled in Jesus. Let's take the first three first. Let me, let me back this up so you can see the, uh, the, the feast again. Okay. So first, Passover and unleavened bread. Again, we've been here, we've been there, done that. Okay. We know that Passover corresponds to Jesus on the cross. Blood of the lamb, death, substitution, all of that stuff. And unleavened bread, the leaven of uh, represents sin. So unleavened is uh, being clean and holy. In other words, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a seven day, it's a process, it's a length of time. In other words, that is going to uh, um, correspond to sanctification. So Passover and Unleavened Bread correspond to salvation and sanctification, or if you wish, justification and sanctification. Uh, propitiation and sanctification. There's all kinds of things we could say there. But Good Friday for Passover uh, corresponding, and then the week after, and, and thinking in terms of salvation and sanctification. The first fruits is the day after the Sabbath. Hello. What does Matthew 28, 1 and Mark 16, 1 have to say about the day after the Sabbath? If you don't know, look it up. You should know this. The last chapter of Matthew and the last chapter of Mark begin. Yeah, it's the story of the resurrection. And they both begin by saying the day after the Sabbath. 
is when it happened. Okay? So the resurrection corresponds to the first fruits feast, or the feast of first fruits corresponds to the resurrection. In other words, the resurrection is the fulfillment of it, we could say. All right? Listen to 1 Corinthians 15 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died. What does that mean? He died. He rose again. That means he is the first fruits. He's the first of many who will die physically. Everybody in this room is going to die unless Jesus comes back first. Everybody who has ever lived besides Enoch and Elijah has died. And because he died and rose again, he's the first fruits. That means that, yes, we die, but yes, we also rise again. Praise the Lord. That is our hope. Our hope is that we have a hope in a resurrection that we will have glorified bodies and live eternally with him. That's what it's all about, people. This, this little, these few years that we have, drop in the bucket. Okay? So the first fruits corresponds to the resurrection. Jesus fulfills the first fruits feast in, that was a lot of F's and S's, first fruits feasts in, uh, in his resurrection. Okay, the, la the last one of this group of three is Pentecost. Another, uh, 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 um, the Feast of Weeks, right? 49 days after, 50 days after, seven weeks after Easter is Pentecost Sunday. We know that. Um, and so, obviously, uh, Pentecost is fulfilled by Pentecost, okay? The Feast of Weeks is fulfilled in this event that we know as Pentecost. It's the event that occurred on Pentecost, which, of course, I'm talking about Acts chapter 2, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. After Jesus' ascension, let's look a little bit at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 because it, I think, tells quite a bit of the story of the comparison, if you will, between uh, the Feast of Weeks or the law version of Pentecost and the spirit version of Pentecost. Okay? It says, our sufficiency is from God. I'm beginning, this is verse 6 now. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. When he says the letter, you could substitute the word law. Paul and his homies are ministers of the new covenant, not of the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. There is a distinction, a contrast between Feast of Weeks, the law version of this date, which kills. It brings death because it convicts, because we're in sin, and now I have this law thing that tells me I'm wrong. It convicts me, and it condemns me, in fact. Okay, that's what it means by the law kills. But the Spirit gives life. So... The New Testament, the Acts chapter 2 version of what happens on this date is the opposite. One kills, one gives life. Keep reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 beginning verse 7. If the ministry of death, that is the law, written and engraved on stones, hello, Ten Commandments, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. Remember when Moses' face glowed? Eventually, his face stopped glowing. So the law, which was so glorious as to make him light up like a light bulb, eventually went away. But, Verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit with a capital S not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. I'm going to preach myself happy. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 17, you know it. And you, you know uh, we got a campus over there that likes to shout it out. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Right? That's the context of that. 
Feast of Weeks, the law brings death, but the, uh, uh, yes, the law brings death. The law happens over here, but in the New Covenant, we get, at the same time, the Spirit. The uh, fulfillment of this event is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Now, here's one more little cool tidbit on this. Do you remember when Moses came down off the mountain and they had the golden calf situation? And do you remember what happened with uh, the rebels? Moses came, let me read it to you. Verse 25, when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them, to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, the Lord's, the, This says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp, and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Do you remember this? The Levites go out with the sword. The sons of Levi, uh, verse 28, did according to the word of Moses. And what happened? About 3,000 men fell that day. On the day the law was given. Feast of Weeks. Are you getting it? Acts 2.41. Those who gladly received his word, that is Peter's word, when he preached the message at Pentecost, were baptized. And that day what? 3, About 3,000 souls were added. Come on, Jesus. I lost 3,000 back then. I'm going to get them back on day one over here. You can't make this stuff up. They didn't make that stuff up. Now, you can't tell me they would have thought of that. Oh, we'll put this in here. It'll look cool. It'll be like, oh, it's the same amount. They weren't thinking about that. It's just what happened. God is cool. <laughs> Feast of Trumpets. All right, so those were the first three, okay? Passover and, and unleavened bread, crucifixion, uh, slash salvation, sanctification. First fruits, resurrection. Uh, uh, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, that all has to do with what? The first coming of Jesus. Feast of Trumpets. New back half, right? Dip, last half of the year, beginning of the last half of the year. This is, a, this is the, the beginning over here. Now we got the end over here. Feast of Trumpets, verse 51 of what? 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Listen to this. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the what? The last trumpet. Hello, Feast of Trumpets. The last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. You should have brought your trumpet today, Mark. I should have said, Mark, bring your trumpet. Okay. Uh, the The... The trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Here is 1 Thessalonians beginning, well, chapter 4, beginning at verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, this is Paul talking, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, dead. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice with the voice of an archangel and with what? The trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The feast of trumpets is fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus uh, the, when the trumpet sounds, Jesus will return. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And so the Feast of Trumpets, this first of this second pair, this, these, these last three, is the beginning of the end fulfilled in Jesus' second coming. He comes back with the sound of the trumpet. Well, what happens after he comes back? Judgment Day. 
Now, depending on who, who you ask, there might be several other things happening. But there is going to be a judgment day after he returns. And that's the next piece of fulfillment. The day of atonement, we already talked about how it can be seen as a fulfillment, as fulfilled in the crucifixion. But it also, because it falls after the second coming and before the end, uh, which we'll see in just a minute, um, Judgment Day is the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. Listen to this. You remember when Jesus taught about the end times? Uh, and uh, first of all, on Day of Atonement, you remember the two goats? And one goes one way and one goes another way. There's, there's two destinies for these two goats on the Day of Atonement. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on His left. There's a day coming when uh, G- Jesus will judge all people. Now, depending on who you ask, it might be more than one day, whatever. One, maybe there's one day for good people and one day for bad people. That doesn't make too much of a difference to me. The point is there is a judgment day coming for the unrighteous. They will be judged and condemned. There's a judgment day coming for us. We will be judged in a different way. We will be, we are, we are not guilty already, but we will be judged according to our works for rewards. We will be reward, our judgment day will be a judgment of reward. We will be rewarded for the things we do uh, that he is pleased with, okay? So there's a judgment day coming, and that judgment day involves a separation of sheep and goats, similar to the separation of goat and goat, In the Day of Atonement. So the Day of Atonement is fulfilled in the Judgment Day. Finally, the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you know what the word means in John 1.14? I I, I have, we've talked about this before. I don't remember how many would remember it. So I'm going to say it again. But this is a real cool thing. John 1.14, who knows it? Doesn't have to be a direct quote. But John chapter 1, verse 14 is where it talks about Jesus doing what? John 1, 1 says what? In in the beginning was the Word. What does the Word do in verse 14? Yes, became flesh and there's the Word. That Word dwelt literally means He pitched His tent. The idea of tabernacles is the idea of being with him. The Feast of Tabernacles was his provision for them and bringing them out of Egypt and bringing him unto himself. Pastor Bud likes to talk about that that's why he brought them out was to, to come to himself. Okay. Jesus, when he came, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word came and pitched his tent. In other words, he made his home with us. Okay? Now, Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, before we say what he says, where are we? We are new heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem, knew everything, the end, the end has come, and we are going into the everlasting now. And I heard a loud voice saying from heaven, Revelation 21, 3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. The Feast of Tabernacles is fulfilled in the new heaven and the new earth in the end. After Judgment Day, after Jesus returns, after Judgment Day, and when we are with him forever, that is the ultimate fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. All right? For the personal practical application, we're going to turn it over to Brother Leonard. And I meant to, Cole, I meant to mention this so that we could have a mic, but is this thing on? It is on, isn't it? Check. 
Give it up for Brother Leonard. So I'm going to do that from here rather than up there. So um, do you remember the video? Do, I don't do all of this mic much, so remind me to put it up here. So do you remember the video that we saw with the men on the panel, um, the strange fire? So um, which was a little painful to watch, was it not? So when we got in the car, um, we always say to each other, so what did you get? And um, so Julia looked at me and she said, so what do you think? And I said, do you know all the things that John MacArthur said on the video? And she said, yeah. I said, I used to preach all those same things. And the look on her face made me glad that she wasn't driving the car. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually, I'm always glad that she, no, I'm just kidding. But, um, oh, oh, boo. So I was, we came to Lynchburg when I was 16 years old. I'd been raised in Colorado at a very, very, legalistic church and then we came here to Thomas Road which was times 10 from what we had had before and so you learn what's being taught to you and that's what you that's what you internalize and too many Christians do that instead of the word and I remember Dr. Falwell saying two things will keep a man from ever being used of God going through a divorce or believing that tongues are for today and so um, yeah well so um, I got called to preach under James Robinson's ministry when I was between my senior year in high school and my freshman year in college. And James Robinson then, if you're not familiar with him, was the Baptist evangelist of America. He was being touted as being stronger than Billy Graham someday and was preaching citywide crusades and was powerful, powerful preacher. So a series of events, I got to know him well. I got called under to preach under his ministry and listened to everything he said, preached some of the same things he was preaching, because that's kind of how I learned. Listen to his tape, preach what he preached, and begin, because you're not a word person, you're kind of doing what you're being taught to do. Um, James was very anti-charismatic. He would make fun of them. I remember him saying, those charismatics are driving me crazy. Wouldn't even call them charismatics. He made fun charismatics, you know? And um, so he, if those of you that are familiar with him, he was doing citywide crusades. I was actually on staff with James Robinson for a while in the summer where we go to a citywide crusade. He would preach at night. Jay Strack and I would preach during the day to the young people. And um, Dr. Falwell, because I knew him well, Dr. Falwell formed the Jerry Falwell Evangelistic Association. There were two of us, young preacher boys is what they called us. We traveled for Dr. Falwell and with Dr. Falwell preached in some of the largest churches in America and preached what we were hearing what you heard John MacArthur saying. And um, then James Robinson had an experience that was kind of incredible. So he was preaching a citywide crusade, and that evening when he was done, he went to his hotel room and a man knocked on his door. The man's name was Milton Green. He was a carpet cleaner. He'd been married three times. Country boy, I've heard him preach, just country. And uh, he opened, James opened the door and he looked at him and he goes, you're probably the best preacher I ever heard. In fact, you may be the best preacher that's ever lived. You're the most demonically oppressed man I've ever seen. You're more bound up and you're in more bondage than any man I've ever met. And he walks in his room and he grabs a chair, puts the chair in the middle of the room, and he said to James, sit down, boy. Well, James said later, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't have made him sit in that chair with a charismatic man in the room. But for some reason, he sat down. And uh, he said Milton Green must have believed that the way to get the devil's attention was to scream at him because he said he was screaming. He said, I was so hoping that the hotel rooms were thick walls so that nobody was hearing what was going on. He said he cast out lust. He cast out, he said he spoke against everything in my life. I'm wondering how does this man know everything about me? And James was so bound up, so he gets done. All done, he looks over and says, how you feel, boy? And he said, just the same. And he goes, doesn't matter, because it's done. And he leaves his room. And James goes to bed, and he woke up the next morning with a pillow soaking wet, sobbing, Holy Spirit all over him. The room was full of the glory of God, and his life was forever changed. The next two or three days, man, he just got Holy Spirit. He just got changed. And the next year, he preached to 
estimates are about 500,000 people in the next year, most of them Baptists, because remember, he'd been a Baptist, and people didn't know what had happened to him, so they were still inviting him to their Baptist churches. In one church one night, they had to stop people from jumping off the balcony to get to the altar to get set free from his preaching. He was powerful. He preached to a conference with pastors, Baptist pastors, one night. And um, he told the story, and he put a chair up on the platform and said, a man made me sit in the chair, and he gets done. And 300 pastors on their face, and a man ran from the back, one of the pastors. And he grabbed a chair, and he set it on the platform, and he said, a man set you in a chair and set, him, set you free. He sits in the chair, and he said, set me free. Set me free. And it was happening all over. Well, Dr. Falwell heard about it. And so James was uninvited and disinvited from ever speaking at Thomas Road again. And I was, of course, a part of that, you know, stuff that was going on. So then something happened, and then I went through a divorce, which you know how I'd have been better off to rob a bank and kill some people and then go to jail, go to jail and come out and have a testimony, you know, and then have a ministry. So, um, and I got a phone call, and James said to me, I know your life's really in a disaster place. Um, I have John Wimber coming to my conference this week. I want to fly you out here and I want you to stay with me and go to the conference. So my mind is like, well, you're a charismatic, you know, because <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. But um, I had no, I didn't have any other options because back then when you went through a divorce, you were done. I mean, I lost my family and the church and my friends. There was nobody. So I flew out there and that first night going to the conference, James said to me, um, there's a girl coming tonight. She's going to get healed. She's a bubble girl. She has to wear a mask. She can't breathe oxygen. If she does, she'll die. She takes pills, like handfuls of pills every day. She has no immune system. She can't eat food grown in America. It has to come from overseas. But for her to eat or she'll die, she's coming to the service tonight. God's going to heal her. And I was like, yeah, okay. So John Wimber preached that night. And um, when he got done, this was really cool about John Wimber. If you've never watched him preach, John would get done preaching. And he would, he loved to preach, but he'd say, okay, let's do the fun stuff now. Let's get to the good stuff. So he said that that night. Let's, and there were probably several thousand people in the room. And he said, let's get to the good stuff. And when he did, he turned and he looked at the girl sitting in the auditorium. And um, I was there, watched the whole thing, or I would never believe this. And when he looked at her, she stood up and took her mask off. And a shaft of light came through the ceiling and enveloped her. For those of you old enough, think, beam me up, Scotty. That kind of shaft of light and just enveloped her. So I don't know how long she stood in that light, but we were all just, you, you couldn't move. The weight of the glory of the Lord was so powerful. So she stood there for a while, and then she sat down, and the light was just gone. And um, so... We got in the car that night, and James was like, what do you think? And I'm like, yeah, dude, I don't know, man. So the next morning, I went downstairs, and we went to breakfast, and she was sitting in the cafeteria, and I went over and said to her, so how do you feel? She had no mask. She was eating regular food. She said, I took no medicine today. I'm totally and completely healed. Three months later, I called her on the phone and said, tell me, how, how are you now? And she said, it's real. I'm, I'm totally and completely healed. And my whole thought process changed. So the question is, why did it change? So it didn't change because someone told me what the word of God really said. It changed because of what Paul said. I didn't come with man's wisdom and eloquent speech. I came and demonstrated to you the power of the gospel. Um, the word demonstrated means to show it off to make it just explode in front of people. And so what happened was I saw Holy Spirit demonstrated, and it was demonstrated, then I believed it. So, so let me say this very carefully. Probably the most beautiful thing about the night that we saw the video was what you did. Because in the end, you got up and you asked God for mercy and that those men would be drawn to you. And let me say, I love the fact that 
part of the exercise was where does the word of God say what fire and we went through all those things and that's really good and you better know what the Bible says about what we believe but you are not going to change anybody's opinion because you know what the Bible believes you are just not they're just going to look at you and say I will prove to you the exact opposite with verses I know here look at these verses and you'll have a spiritual biblical tug of war and that's the only thing you'll you'll accomplish and I actually don't want to do too much of this because I'm preaching November 19th and I'm going to do part of this but but the demonstration of the power of God is what we have to get to because when it's demonstrated don't, nobody can say any word so here's what should have happened that night on that platform if somebody would have gone up on the platform with a word of knowledge and looked at one of those men and said something for example to the effect of um, you were diagnosed with cancer last week and nobody knows you've never even told your children and I'm gonna pray for you and the person's healed now you've demonstrated the power of the gospel you haven't argued with them and and let me say this carefully also John MacArthur I've read a lot of his stuff and I've followed him and he loves Jesus he does love, he writes good stuff and he loves Jesus he just hasn't gotten to where we are so to speak now I don't know now where he is but so here's what we can't do how many of you never read first and second Peter because Peter argued with Paul and Paul was right and Peter was wrong so we don't read first and second Peter because look at what he did or we love what Peter said and we're like I don't ever read anything Paul wrote because he was because look at the argument they had we have to get to that unity place, you see. So anyway, enough of that. So that's how, that's how we're going to see people change, is demonstrating the power of the gospel. Um, so to the, to the part of um, the scapegoat, that's what I, that's what I shared with um, Gabriel. So we know what Gabriel taught, where there's two goats, one goat slaughtered, the other goat, the priest lays his hands on the goat, and the goat takes all the sins of the people for the year and then they take the goat outside the city so Jewish history will tell you some more to that and that is this so when the goat was outside of the city the people would begin to chant send it away S away with it be done with it go and they would start to yell that and it, usually it was a Gentile because no Jewish person wanted to have anything to do with a goat that had all the p sins of the people on it so a Gentile would go out and wouldn't just let the goat go they would actually drive the goat to a cliff or a precipice and they would drive the goat over it so that it would fall to its death but sometimes the precipice was miles away from where they were camped and so they would stage people at shouting distance from each other all the way until where the goat went over the precipice and when the person that drove it over saw the Jewish person that would be with them would turn and say it is finished and the next person would pick it up and turn and say it is finished all the way back to the city and then the city would have one joyous roar and say it is finished because they knew that their sins were accounted for for one year so when Jesus is on the cross and he says it is finished and actually only John records those words everyone else says with a loud voice he uttered and then he died I'm not sure why you might have to tell us why later I don't know why nobody else recorded it is finished except for one thing who was actually at the cross only John so John heard that and every Jew who heard those words would know what he was talking about would know that he was saying he was the scapegoat and once and for all it was done and and if you study the Greek and actually this is a place where Strong's is way off it's much deeper than what you'd see there um, and it's probably not the only place but this is a Jewish Greek theologian that I, I got this where I want to read it to you because it says it so much better than I could um, the word signifies the successful end to a particular course of action it's the word you would use when you climb to the peak of Mount Everest it's the word you would use when you turn in the final copy of your dissertation it's the word you would use when you make the final payment on your new car or when you cross the finish line of the, your first 10k run 
The word means more than just I survived. It means I did exactly what I set out to do. But there's more here than the verb itself. Tetelestai is the perfect tense in Greek. That's significant because the perfect tense speaks of an action which has been completed in the past with results in continuing into the present. It's different from the past tense, which looks back to the event and says that happened. The perfect tense adds the idea that this happened and is still in effect today. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, he meant it was finished in the past, it is still finished in the present, and it will remain, remain finished in the future. Note one other fact. He did not say, I am finished, for that would imply that he died defeated and exhausted. Rather, he cried out, it is finished, meaning I successfully completed the work I came to do.